fellow astronauts, and you still, I'm sure, consider yourself one, it certainly must be just a very exciting and very interesting time for you, but you're also in the business of briefing the president on what's going on, and I'm sure he's interested as well. Yes, the president is very interested, uh, very concerned, of course, with this flight and all flights. And we're, uh, my staff and the council, along with others, have uh, provided a focus for the White House for information. We're keeping them informed and uh, helping them understand uh, the processes that go on through this flight and this problem. Is this, in a sense, good for the space program, Bill? Well, I think that uh, we have a program that's uh, designed uh, to be forward-looking and balanced. And I think that uh, it's been also designed to be able to accept and cope with a, uh, the various hazards associated with an advancing exploration program. Of course, as I said, we'll stop and, uh, and evaluate the damage. Maybe this, uh, this pause will be a, a period of uh, revitalization and, uh, and uh, deeper analysis. but. My feeling that it was worth going to the moon uh, before Apollo 13. It's certainly worth going uh, to the moon after it and Apollo 14 and beyond. And I'm sure that Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Schweiger would agree with that. And there certainly aren't going to be as many people blasé about the next trip as there were about the, this one as it began. Well, this is a very exciting, stimulating, and, uh, and uh, hazardous business, but one that I think is uh, well worth the risk to this country. Uh, Bill? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Walter Cronkite, yeah, in New York. Uh, uh, would you contemplate that there's going to be any change in the uh, 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 timeline uh, for the space station work uh, uh, because of this? I mean, w w this would delay further moon flights, but you can use the same basic systems to, for the space station operations, which begin in uh, 72, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is it likely to lay the entire program? I mean, we're not going to put any men up doing anything until we get this thing settled, are we? Well, Walter, I think it's quite likely that we'll delay the Apollo program some. Uh, we'll, of course, have to study this in the next uh, few months. But uh, as to whether it would delay the space station program or the Skylab uh, program, I think it's probably much a conjecture at this time. That's still a long ways off. We have time to start making modifications that may be required to the auction system, the service module. And uh, we're going to, I uh, would assume, press on uh, with the intent of keeping on the schedule, but of course, uh, ensuring that crew safety is always uh, a prime objective in the uh, process. I think the real point here, Bill, and uh, you uh, inferred it, in fact, earlier, that is that you have to fly to find out what the problems are. And here we, we found one. And with it, we, we can look forward to a, a design that will optimize this type of plumbing, the, the fact that we could see this failure develop in an oxygen tank. Uh, we learn something, and that's what it's all about. Is this just a, a, a weakness or perhaps a failure because of some uh, shoddy workmanship, let's say, or is this something that's going to have to be redesigned completely, would you guess? I think it's impossible to tell at this time about that. And uh, I think along with uh, Wally's point, certainly the, uh, the covered wagons that went across this country suffered broken axles periodically, and fortunately they stopped and cut down a new tree, fixed it, and pressed on. And I think that's what we have to do in this program. Can't stop and cut down any new trees on no, the way. We can, <laughs> we can do the equivalent. <laughs> well, uh, Bill Anders has to brief the president in about, um, what, 10 minutes 10 from now? And uh, uh, Steve, can I can I delay him just one more sure, minute? I sure. certainly <laughs> hate to get him fired this morning, <laughs> along with all the other troubles we got in the space program right now. But uh, the two criticisms have been uh, leveled in the last uh, 24 hours or so, Bill, from overseas. In Dortmund, Germany, uh, Rudolf Nebel, uh, seven, he's 76 now, he's one of the developers of the liquid fuel engine, as you know, the rocket. He says that uh, we've done the whole thing wrong, uh, that we should have used space stations to get out there, and then we wouldn't have had all these problems of getting fellows back. We could have uh, easily gotten them back to a space station and sent relief out from there. That's one thing. The other thing is in Czechoslovakia, their uh, communist uh, official paper there, the Ruta Pravo, uh, said the question arises whether Apollo 13 start, after all, was not more subject to propaganda interests than the interests of real science. Uh, I think I know your attitude toward that, but what's your official answer? Well, I don't know that I have an official answer, uh, Walter. I have a personal opinion. Of course, with respect to the first uh, question about uh, space station usage around the Earth as a way station to the moon, this, of course, was a point in hot debate in the early Apollo program, and we have determined that the lunar orbit rendezvous technique was the most uh, advantageous way to get to the moon. I'd like to point out that it appeared 
that the Russian program uh, opted for the space station approach. And I'd just like to point out that uh, we have made it to date. Uh, so maybe that ends that part of the argument. Uh, with respect to whether this was a propaganda stunt, uh, uh, not concerned about science, uh, it's my understanding and uh, feeling that, uh, that the majority of the scientists, the scientists uh, over the world, have uh, been greatly enthusiastic about the data that's been brought back to the moon and are eagerly looking forward to receiving more data which will help them understand processes about how the solar system were formed, how the Earth was performed. Thank but you I, very much, Bill. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Steve. And on Robert. to uh, the presidential briefing. The, uh, uh, incidentally, Mr. Nebel, I suppose, Dr. Nebel, uh, helped uh, with the liquid fuel rocket, also was the man after whom they named the Nebelwerfer in World War II. And if you've never heard of a Nebelwerfer, uh, uh, then you haven't really <laughs> lived through World War II. Uh, it was called the, uh, uh, what was it, Whistling Mimi, Whistling Mini, or something like that. At any rate, it, uh, it was a great bank of rockets. Well, you've seen them. The, the mm. Russians had something similar to it uh, and, and sent off all these rockets simultaneously, an artillery barrage, and the things whistled as they came at you. <laughs> and it was the most frightening, horrible sound in the world. I think we ran into it first in the Hurtgen Forest. It was incredibly bad. Of course, the whole key is if you can hear it, then it's all right. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, not with those no, things. They move too slowly. Yeah. You see, and they're coming it. towards you. Yeah. And it, uh, no, it's, that's true of our Old artillery, artillery and, and, yes, uh, and, uh, and uh, sniper's bullets and that sort of thing, but not, not with Neville Verfers. You know, it's yeah. really uh, hard for us, and uh, you saw Bill working on this, to, uh, to defend what we're doing today to an older man who did something very well in his earlier day. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for an older man, I think, to... Uh, keep up. I'm having trouble keeping up with the advances in technology, and I aspire to attaining the age of 76 myself, but I hope I don't pontificate at that age, as this gentleman has. <laughs> well, uh, the situation now, with three hours and 46 minutes before the scheduled splashdown in the Pacific, the spacecraft is doing well. It is separated from the service module. They are uh, now aligning the platform and getting themselves in the right attitude and position for the reentry so that uh, in another couple of hours from now, uh, they can uh, cut loose that uh, lunar module lifeboat and, uh, and then be alone in the command module for what would be the same sort of landing they'd have made if the mission had been successful all the way along. Speaking of the scientific advantages uh, that Bill Anders was just a moment ago, too, it might be pointed out that one part of this mission uh, worked exceedingly well. As Jim Lovell said, well, one thing worked, and that was that they, they did uh, uh, aim the S-4B, uh, third stage of the, the propulsive rockets, uh, into the moon. It impacted with that 11 tons of force that they had, could, were able to calculate, knowing its mass and its speed, and uh, with that, those figures, uh, they're able to read off of the seismometer left in the Apollo 12 experiment some very interesting readings. And uh, uh, those seismometers uh, up there, uh, that seismometer on the moon, kept uh, sending back signals here, the quavering signals for hours thereafter. The, 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 the moon rang like a bell again, as it had when they sent the lunar module uh, uh, mm -hmm. pounding back after Apollo 12 and after Apollo 11. And it, uh, uh, clearly, it's giving the scientists a lot to think about, about the makeup of the moon. It seems almost impossible to believe that this flight began uh, just seven days ago. <laughs> it seems like we've lived through a month, and it certainly must seem like that to those men in Apollo 13 and those fellows in Houston who have worked around the clock since, uh, since the first alarm at 10.08 p.m. Uh, Monday night of the explosion. This might be a good time to look back over those seven days, take a look at them. David Schumacher has a review for us. David? Walter, for what so many people call just another space flight, there's been nothing very ordinary about Apollo 13. Beforehand, around NASA, there were those who worried only half in jest about that number 13. They suggested that 13 be skipped and the program go on to Apollo 14, ignoring the number as hotels ignore the 14th floor. The crew thought that was pretty funny. Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes are not the superstitious type. They both said beforehand that they originally were hoping for a launch in March instead of April, because then it would have come on Friday the 13th. Not even when the great German measles epidemic struck were they ready to change their mind. Not even when they were joined by a stranger for breakfast on launch morning. 
Jack Swigert replacing Ken Mattingly as command module pilot. Lovell and Hayes didn't like it, although Swigert was a good friend. Mostly, it was because they knew how bitterly disappointed Mattingly would be. Hayes particularly resisted the change. He and Mattingly had known each other a long time. But as Jim Lovell suited up, there was a yawn, proof enough that even he still thought this was going to be just another space flight. Lovell, after all, had been around a long time, not as well known as some astronauts. Nevertheless, he had more time in space than any other man. In fact, more than most of them put together. And so the revised lineup left the dressing room for the playing field. Lovell and Hayes and Swigger. Waiting on the launch pad, the jinx Apollo 13. She'd already behaved strangely, developing little glitches that mysteriously cured themselves. Still, it was just another space flight, Nine, and we all eight, yawned eight, along with love. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 213. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it has cleared the tower. Watching in mission control in the dark suit, the grounded astronaut Ken Mattingly. It was just another space flight to him, but not really. The rest of us still thought it was, even when that engine went out in the second stage. But number 13 made it into orbit, and a short while later was on its way to the moon. With Jack Swigert at the controls, the command module moved around to dock with the lunar module. We still thought it was a test of Swigert more than the machine. We didn't know it, but with the jolt of docking, the astronauts had saved their lives. We're hard docked, uh, Houston. Roger, understand hard dock. Good deal. A short time later, in a new experiment, the S-4B booster was sent on its way to crash into the moon. It would be the only part of Apollo 13 to get there. But still, it was just another space flight. Most of us were wondering how good the television pictures would be. The astronauts' wives had to go into mission control to watch. The rest of us waited until the next scheduled newscast. Okay, Fred, we're getting a good uh, picture of your destination there. And now, Fred, uh, engaged in his favorite pastime I found out on this flight so far. He's not in the food locker, is he? That's his second favorite pastime. He's He's rigging his hammock for sleep on the lunar surface now to try it out to see what it's going to be like. This little tape recorder has been uh, a big benefit. Has been a big benefit to us in, uh, in passing through the time away and our transit out to the mound. And it's uh, rather odd to see it floating like this in, uh, in Odyssey while it's playing uh, the theme from 2001. It would be the last music the astronauts would listen to for a while and the last television broadcast. I think we've had a problem here. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Okay, uh, right now, uh, Houston, the uh, voltage is, um, is looking good. Um, and we hit a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. And as I recall, main B was the one that uh, had a amp spike on it uh, once before. Roger, Fred. In the interim here, uh, we're starting to uh, go ahead and button up the tunnel again. Roger. That jolt uh, must have rocked uh, uh, the sensor uh, on uh, C now in O2 uh, quantity 2. It uh, was oscillating uh, down around 20 to 60 percent. Now it's full scale high again. No one knew for sure just how big the problem was. There'd been an explosion, certainly, but no one suspected it had been powerful enough to blow out the whole side of the service module. However, with two of the electricity generating fuel cells out and the third failing rapidly, the astronauts and mission control had to think fast. Dump everything and try to get back or hang on and go the long way home around the moon. The decision was made, the crew was in the lunar module even before being told, and a worried Chris Kraft and Jim McDivitt went to talk with reporters. Started by saying that uh, we have a serious problem uh, in the command and service module. 
we appear to have had some kind of uh, accident with the uh, in the region of the fuel cells and the oxygen tanks. We have not tried too much to reconstruct the uh, what has happened because we are more concerned at the moment for getting the situation under control. Uh, as you have seen, we've uh, begun to use the uh, limb as a device for keeping oxygen in both the command and service command module and the lunar module, and we're using the power system from the lunar module. Uh, the, it appears at the present time that everything is under control and that uh, we have a safe situation at the moment. Give me if I put you on a spot, but how would you classify this situation? as regards to these that we are familiar with a little well, bit. I'd, I'd say this is as serious a uh, situation as we, ever, we have ever had in manned space flight. A big test had to come almost immediately. On its present course, Apollo 13 would never get back. The lunar module's descent engine had to work to put them on a free return trajectory. Roger, Aquarius, and you go for the burn. 40%. Okay, Aquarius, you're looking good. It was another crucial moment in the flight, and no one was calling it just another space flight now. The lunar module engine worked perfectly. It was a rescue mode that had been dreamed of, but no one ever thought would be needed. Now, quite a few people realized that if this had happened much later in this flight, after lunar operations had started, for instance, the astronauts could not have survived. Okay, Houston, burn's complete. Now we have to talk about uh, power down, and uh, what do you want to do with the... Uh Thanks. Roger, uh, we're looking at that right now, and uh, you'll be the first one to get to work. The important thing now was to save. Save electrical power, save water, save oxygen. The astronauts in their lifeboat lamb were like maroon sailors, carefully parceling out each gram of the essentials of life in space. Apollo 13 was limping home, everyone praying there would be no more trouble. On the ground, even before men, the men were safe, there was speculation that this meant the end of the space program. And that worried NASA officials almost as much as the emergency. The director of the space agency, Dr. Thomas Paine, talked with reporters. I think that you're touching here on the future of lunar exploration. And there's no question at all that we have had a setback in this mission. There's no question at all that we will very thoroughly review all of our equipments, procedures, but beyond that, I can say unequivocally that man will explore the moon. Risks are involved. These risks are risks which we have accepted in the past, not only in lunar exploration, but in all areas of exploration where man has pressed forward into the unknown. Far out in space, the issue still in doubt. Apollo 13, which could afford no more trouble, was getting it. The carbon dioxide level building up in the cabin. Still, the astronauts refused to panic, and what used to be called American ingenuity, they jerry-rigged a solution. I understand that we have about 16 cartridges in the command module, and each one will have a lifetime of about 12 hours. And we'll be running two at a time, one on each of the suit loops and the limb. So that could be fixed, but the question persisted. How much else could go wrong? Meanwhile, guidance officers studied the trajectory, and they were worried. 13 was on course, but outside the corridor that guaranteed a safe return. Again, we waited and worried. Looks like you're a little bit outside the corridor. So we're looking at a uh, seven foot per second mid-course at uh, 104 hours. We are going to come up with a uh, entry interface minus eight pad to use in the event of a lost comm situation. Now, for the first time, most of us began to feel as confident as the astronauts sounded. In mission control, they returned to normal operations. A few people even managed to sleep. An entire control team under Gene Kranz was detached to start working on re-entry procedures. After deciding the details, they set up special simulator runs to be sure they'd get it right. The grounded astronaut, Ken Mattingly, still free of German measles, went into the simulator too, tested each procedure. He wanted to personally assure his old crewmates everything was all right. If eyes were still red, there were smiles now, this one belonging to flight director 
Jerry I Griffin. Test tonight uh, remove all concern about any deterioration in the command module uh, since it's been enacted three days. Uh, it certainly uh, gives us a, a good feeling about it. Uh, of course, any any mission, I guess you always have when things are in front of you to do that are very difficult. You you want to make sure the systems work right, and you can't really tell that until you get there. But I think we all got confidence in the command module now. And the look, we, I had confidence in it before, but the look at the data tonight uh, really made us all feel, if I can say it, warmer, because they, for the most part, the command module was warmer. Uh, I feel pretty good about it, and in fact, I feel real good about it. I think we can press right on into a normal entry now. But a normal entry was still thousands of miles away, cold and dark miles, Cold because with the electrical equipment turned off to conserve power, temperatures plunged to near freezing. The astronauts were using flashlights to see what they were doing. But the conservation program worked. Apollo 13 was coming home with plenty to spare. Two old timers, Jim Lovell and Deke Slayton, reassured each other in the early morning hours. Hey Jim, well you're up and things are nice and quiet. Let me uh give you a couple other things to think about. One specifically, I know none of you are sleeping worth a damn because it's a cold. And uh, you might want to dig out the medical kit there around 135 or in that ballpark and uh, pull out a couple dexedrines a piece and try one about then on another around uh, 139 to 140. Well, I could figure a way to get a hot cup of coffee up to you. It probably tastes pretty good about now, wouldn't it? Yeah, true. Uh, you don't realize how cold this thing becomes. And that, until now, is the story of Apollo 13. But no one is sure any longer whether to call her unlucky or lucky. This is David Schumacher. You know, that uh, whole matter of the dexedrine and the condition of the men up there, tired and cold, uh, wonder really how they, how they are getting along. And the fellow who probably knows better than anybody else is standing by with Bruce Morton down in Houston, Dr. Charles Barry, the astronaut physician. Come in, gentlemen. Walter, uh, you've known Dr. Barry for more years than I have, I guess. Doctor, this uh, flight has presented some unusual problems, uh, fatigue being the most obvious one that comes to mind. Are we going to get uh, three exhausted astronauts back? Well, I think we have uh, three astronauts who are very exhausted at, right at the moment. Uh, ever since the incident, uh, we've had very little in the way of sleep. They've uh, had difficulties certainly because of concern about their status and the status of consumables and then the cold has made that just almost impossible to sleep. So even though they've had some down time, they haven't really gotten good value from that rest. Because of this, uh, we decided last night, Deke and I had a long talk last night and, and decided that uh, we'd get the word to them about the dexedrine and we asked them to take one uh, about 135 hours, which they have done, and a second one because you don't want to get the big let down uh, just prior to uh, entry. And so a uh, second one will be necessary around 139 hours, and that should carry them through the re-entry time. Were you uh, concerned at all about fatigue affecting performance? There was a point uh, early this morning uh, when uh, Jim Lovell started to program a burn the wrong way, and a lot of us were wondering if that just wasn't overtiredness. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, we were very concerned about its effect on performance, and uh, all of us have been trying to watch that very carefully and uh, working with the Capcoms to keep an eye on it. There, Jim is probably very well aware of this as an individual because they got into some difficulty this way on Apollo 8, the first uh, lunar mission, when. Uh, the time schedule of that flight was such that uh, it was impossible to uh, get sleep during the, the circumlunar time. And we knew that ahead of time, and the, the crew uh, were up and were fatigued, and Jim found himself making some errors, and he, some of those were caught from the ground and some he caught, but he was perfectly aware of it, and we talked about this at some length prior to this mission, and so I think that we couldn't have a crew that's uh, better prepared to face a, a situation like this. Going back to uh, Monday night and the start of the trouble, what were you <coughs> most worried about? Uh, water, oxygen, uh, clean air, the lithium hydroxide problem? 
Well, of course, we were worried about all of them initially because we weren't really sure uh, right at the outset where we were going to end up with margins in any of these things. It became very obvious early in the game that uh, the oxygen was going to be fine, that we were going to have a fairly good pad there. Uh, the two that we still had some concern about were the CO2 uh, and the water. Uh, we worked out uh, everything we could get with the CO2 and we decided that uh, one of the things we would do was try and double our limit that would be allowable and we increased the limit up uh, to 15 millimeters of uh, mercury CO2 and that would allow us then to extend the life of the canister that was in. Uh, we did extend that. As a matter of fact, we got uh, uh, double the lifetime out of that canister, and that helped us a great deal. Uh, we then uh, had had the people working in the lab to try and uh, find a way that we could use the command module canisters, and we had thought even about, if necessary, just taking those canisters and, uh, and uh, pulling the top off so that uh, it, they could absorb but it's far better if you can run, run it through them. And this worked out very well, and we're still using that system right now. Uh, and uh, this kludge has worked just beautifully, and so we came out very well with that. Up until last night, we still had some concern about the water, and uh, they ran out of water in the, in the uh, command module tank last night. And uh, we recalculated what we had left and the pads that they thought they might need in, uh, in the limb and uh, finally decided they, we had enough water to, uh, to, to force that because it's very important they get hydrated right now uh, prior to this uh, increasing demand that they're going to have in the latter stages of the flight. The shivering is an interesting thing too because as cold as they are, this does increase some metabolic demand and it also increases some water demand. And you'd think that being cold, you know, you wouldn't want anything more, but uh, as a matter of fact, you end up needing more. One uh, other question that I guess you've heard uh, five or 10,000 times in the last few days, uh, when's Ken Mattingly going to get the measles? I wish I knew the answer to that question. But, uh, I think we have to understand that uh, he may not get the measles. Ah. That's, that's <laughs> possible. And uh, we certainly understood that at the time this decision was made, and it wasn't an easy thing to do. There was uh, roughly from all of the uh, information at our disposal, it was obvious that he had about a 75% chance of, of becoming ill. Uh, the odds that have uh, plagued us on this whole flight about, uh, we had two individuals here and in, out of uh, the six crewmen, prime and backup, we had two individuals who were susceptible to uh, rubella, and that's almost unheard of. Uh, that, that kind of percentage in the general population certainly doesn't exist. So uh, here we were hit with some odds, and so whether he's going to still stay in that sort of odds, I don't know. He has had some changes in blood count, which uh, indicate some uh, viral involvement, and still we're dealing in an area where there just isn't any information right now about uh, what happens to people in a, in a prodromal period. I mean, we're, we're trying to project from laboratory data where normally doctors don't see people at this stage of an illness. You don't go to see the doctor until you're already sick. Chuck, this is, yes. uh, I, I really appreciate, I'm sure the whole public does, that explanation uh, on <laughs> rubella. But I want to know the story behind the story. What's <laughs> Ken Mattingly said to you in the last 48 hours? And what have you said to Ken? Has he by any chance a little happier now that he didn't go on this flight? Well. I don't think Ken would ever uh, feel that uh, he'd be happy that he didn't go on the flight. He, he has understood from uh, the outset uh, the data. We went over it very carefully with him so that he could understand uh, what we were using to decide. He's even looked at his own blood smears. And uh, he, he feels that uh, at the present time he still has a, a hope that he isn't going to get ill, although secretly he says he really hopes he does because he knows we, all of us would feel better about it. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, I have one other thing on your prescriptions here. I notice you're giving the fellows uppers to get them downer. Is that right? Oh, that sounds like Wally. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's exactly what we're doing, Wally. Well, I think you got that one right. I wish you luck with Ken Manningly in the future. Thanks a lot, Wally.
That raises the question, Wally, do you give them downers to get them up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one other thing of May, Chuck. Uh, what yes, about uh, what about heart rates? Uh, I know they went up uh, after they uh, understood the severity of the problem back in the service module Monday night. Have there been uh, have they stayed up? Have there been other points where they have gone up? Uh, what what's been transpiring in that regard? Well, it's been very hard to uh, answer that one, Walter, because w the. Uh, situation with biomed data in the limb is such that you only get one individual. Now, in our powered down state and some of the comm modes we've been in, uh, in order to, to get comm at all, we've uh, been without biomed. So we've seen just little snatches of data as we've gone along. Uh, those rates indicate that they, they are up some. There's certainly a chronic tension level going on here. Uh, we will get some rates again when we get them back into the command module here uh, and get powered up, so we'll have data during that phase pre-reentry. And I would be really amazed if they didn't have some elevated rates. In view of this uh, strain situation, have you given the uh, uh, medics aboard the Iwo Jima, I think there are nine of them out there who will be uh, examining the astronauts as soon as they get back, any special instructions, anything special they're going to be looking for? We are going to certainly look uh, very carefully because of this strain, and we may modify some of the things that we do uh, in the light of it. For instance, I think the important thing here is to look at these individuals as uh, people that you want to uh, handle clinically. In short, what's best for them as individuals, and uh, we're, we're not in just a data collection mode here. The important thing is to say, uh, if, if we think a certain test shouldn't be done because of their markedly fatigued state, we won't do it, in other words. We Sir? want to assess their status and do the best thing for them from a clinical point of view, just like your doctor would here on the ground. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles Berry in Houston. And now we're going to inside Mission Control Center, where our television correspondent, Roy Neal, standing by. This module, there were some quizzical looks on every face in the room as Lovell gave his somewhat frightening description of the hole in the side of the service module cause unknown, but what could have been disastrous failure had it happened after the lunar module was separated. And these men here in Mission Control knew better than anyone else how serious the situation could have been. They've settled back now, things going well with preparations to separate the lifeboat, the lunar module, and enter in about three hours. The Apollo 13 astronauts got no sleep during the night, have been advised to take dexedrine. And now Flight Director Gene Kranz, after two days of simulating this precise sequence of events, is talking to his controllers. The team's working smoothly, if a little tensely, troubleshooting, changing systems slightly. Very little trouble so far, all going well from what I can hear on the private circuits in Mission Control. This is Roy Neal in Mission Control. Roy Neal's not alone in Mission Control, as you can see by that uh, picture, nor uh, uh, is, is the uh, VIP viewing area exactly empty. Uh, Representative Jerry Pettis of California, who is on the House Science and Astronautics Committee, and Major General Sam Phillips, who is the uh, uh, former Apollo Program Director, George Miller, the former NASA Associate Administrator for Manned Space Flight, Walter uh, Capryan, the Director of Launch Operations Kennedy Space Center, Dr. Kirk Debus, the head of the uh, Kennedy Space Center. They're all there in mission control now for these uh, critical last uh, three hours and 20 minutes. And there are a lot of uh, the astronauts who are there, some on duty, uh, some merely as observers at the moment, but always available for consultation, of course. Charles Duke, uh, who is the backup uh, lunar module pilot for this mission, and the fellow who uh, first got the measles from a next-door neighbor there at the Manned Space Center in Houston, uh, he's uh, out of quarantine now for the measles. He's been at home getting a lot of garden work done uh, while he's been uh, isolated. He's uh, back and up and around today and is in mission control along with the fellow who hasn't got the measles yet, but because he was susceptible to them, was bounced off this flight, Ken Mattingly. Also in mission control, Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan, who were uh, Apollo 10 uh, astronauts, Jim McDivitt, Russell Schweikert, David Scott from Apollo 9, Ed Aldrin of Apollo 11. Uh, they're all in mission control, and there'll undoubtedly be others there as the morning goes on. As we've reported, the eyes of the world are upon this 
uh, return of Apollo 13 today. Uh, the uh, satellite uh, communications net is being used to carry reports uh, live directly to most of the uh, countries of the world. British Prime Minister Harold Wilson uh, just announced a little while ago that he's canceling a speech uh, that he was to have made in England uh, this evening because of Apollo 13 drama. As he put it, I've decided not to make a speech this evening because most of us will be concentrating on those critical hours when they are getting close to the Earth's atmosphere and to the splashdown. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, a little later in the day in uh, England than it is here, such is the nature of the way the sun and the Earth uh, are in juxtaposition. Uh, it's 10 minutes of 10 uh, here at Eastern Time, and it's uh, now 10 minutes of 3 uh, in England in the afternoon. It's three hours and 18 minutes now until a splashdown, three hours and 14 minutes before they enter the Earth's atmosphere at 400,000 uh, feet. 400,000 meters, actually. 400,000 feet, kilometers. Feet, sir. <laughs> 400 kilometers, 400,000 meters, and that's uh, uh, approximately 400,000 yards, something a little over that. Uh, distance is 31,007, uh, about 31,000 miles from Earth now, and their velocity is up around 8,500 miles an hour. They got a new uh, readout from the ground a little while ago, uh, new calculations of their uh, entry on the basis of that uh, last uh, burn of the RCS uh, little jets around the uh, lunar module, which uh, tweaked them into the exact course right down the corridor, and they are right down that corridor. They like an entry angle of minus 6.5 degrees, and they're only one one-hundredth of a degree off of that, according to the tracking information. Uh, their velocity at uh, entry will be 24,700 miles an hour at uh, that 400,000 foot level, which is the critical one where they hit the interface with the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that time is unchanged from the prediction as of last night. That's 12.53 uh, Eastern time this afternoon, or 12.53 and 40 seconds to be actually precise. The uh, splashdown coordinates have changed just three miles uh, from the prediction as of last night as a result of that last burn. The coordinates, uh, if you are interested in following this on a map, are 21 degrees, 40 minutes south, 165 degrees, and 20 minutes west, three minutes a little further east uh, on downrange uh, than uh, the, they would uh, be otherwise. They're coming, they're coming from the west on your map, but toward the east uh, as they make this landing. Downrange is a little further east. Uh, the maximum uh, G load, uh, that is the gravity force as they come in, has been calculated at 6.7, and that's just uh, nominal, right on the uh, usual mark, isn't it, uh, Wally? That's uh, just about the average one, you're right, and uh, I guess I translated nominal for you that time. <laughs> <laughs> you're becoming very spacey using the word nominal. Uh, of course, 6.7 G is not a number to be sneezed at. This means that a man who weighs 200 pounds would be approximating 1,400 pounds. So this is uh, quite in contrast to being weightless. Uh, of course, the advantage that we have, and people seem to think this is a difficult load, it is, it's a, it is a nominal load uh, for an astronaut. Uh, we've been trained to take loads up to 16 Gs. But again, it's on our back, where the load is distributed over a large area, in contrast to sitting up in a seat such as in an aircraft. Uh, the spacecraft has a limit uh, just by guidance. It can go much higher of 10 Gs, meaning that you can, by guidance, correct any errors. Uh, the automatic guidance system will program the lift vector to a point where as it approaches 10 Gs, the vehicle will start to pull out of its dive and, and have less gravitational pull on it. Now, you can exceed that uh, safely. Uh, the design structure will take it. How long does this uh, 6.7 maximum G load last? Fortunately, not very long. The, uh, the G load builds up very slowly, and there are uh, milestones that you pass, like 0.01 g and 0.05 g, which are very small decimals. Uh, it takes a long time before the acceleration builds up to this peak. And what you really are doing, you're playing the temperature pulse, this 5,000 degree heat pulse that comes across the heat shield against the acceleration so that you don't exceed too much temperature buildup uh, and, of course, do not build up too much acceleration buildup. So the two are balanced. 
Uh, the uh, the G pulse itself, I suspect, lasts uh, in this case not more than about 30, 40 seconds. Then it starts back Since down. Since you're again. lying on your back, which is the configuration in the spacecraft for that reason primarily, uh, uh, the uh, the load is distributed so you don't get a uh, uh, you're not likely to be rendered unconscious by blood flowing down to the. No, it doesn't feet. flow from your head down. It yeah. just flows back. We call this, in fact, eyeballs in rather than eyeballs down. <laughs> <laughs> That's the direction your eyeballs are going. Yeah. Do you actually feel it? Oh, you feel it quite, quite uh, you strongly. Feel your eyeballs going in. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't wow. noticed that. Uh, in fact, the worst thing to do, uh, and you'll find this true with almost any pilot, particularly a fighter pilot, who does pull acceleration, is to look in the mirror and see yourself. Your face gets pulled way back, mm -hmm. and it's rather uh, ungodly looking. Oh, I remember some of those early pictures of, uh, what was his name, Stapp, who yes, uh, did the early yes, sled. Uh, sled uh, well, as a result, everyone thinks that's the way it should be done. And <laughs> do you, uh, uh, tell me, we used to, think about this, uh, I know a lot of worry about it, as a matter of fact, the early days of, uh, of planning for space flight. Do your arms get stuck down on the controls so you can't lift them to punch those buttons? Well, it's interesting that that is a problem, and uh, as a result, we build up armrests so our elbows, the skeletal structure, picks up the load, so your arm doesn't tend to come back off and pull the hand controller with it. Because this would be awkward, then you'd put in a, an attitude change that you wouldn't want to have. So we trained on centrifuges uh, that levels up to 10 to 12 Gs and flew re-entries. So all of these things have been done. Uh, uh, it's been quite a while since people have seen pictures of flight crews whistling around this swinging arm, but that's exactly why we were doing that. Uh, another fellow who has done that uh, for Rio, down in Houston with Bruce Morton, astronaut Gene Cernan, who flew to the moon on Apollo 10, is now Apollo 14 backup commander. And he's been doing a lot of the work in the simulators down there in uh, Houston ever since this uh, situation developed Monday night, uh, checking the procedures for Apollo 13. Bruce? Gene, uh, I know this has been a long week for everybody in the simulators. Uh, what was your biggest concern at the start? Was it, uh, did you have a lot of new things to do or stringing old things together in a new way? Or what were you most worried about? Well, Bruce, let me say it's uh, certainly been a long week for uh, a lot of people, uh, but I think those three guys up there will never forget this week because it's been a long one for them. What we tried to do initially when we, uh, we had the problem uh, on Monday, uh, we knew we'd have to begin to rely almost totally for the, uh, on a limb for not only our consumables, for, but for our uh, dynamic response. In other words, we'd have to use the limb attitude control system, the LEM propulsion systems, uh, in a configuration that we have tried them once, evaluate them, such as on uh, Apollo 9, but we never were really confronted with uh, utilizing them in a situation like this before. So uh, we pretty rapidly cranked up the simulators with a tremendous amount of support from this whole center and from people in industry all over the country and uh, attempted to evaluate not only the, uh, the dynamics, which we pretty well uh, were assured uh, would work. We had a pretty good handle on them from all of our many years of, of analyzation uh, in building and designing the spacecraft. We just wanted to re-verify our procedures uh, for the benefit of the crew. And when you have something as, uh, as valuable as uh, our mission simulators, uh, down here at the Cape, we have simulators at North America and MIT and Grumman, uh, all of which we're working. Uh, it's foolhardy to guess and rely on some of your past uh, work, so we just reproved everything before we sent it up to the crew. The next uh, big step, obviously, is uh, separating from the limb, and uh, it's essentially the same procedure you used on 10, isn't it? Yeah, well, we, uh, we've got a real da uh, real-time data point on separating the uh, command module on LEM with a pressurized tunnel. As you remember on 10, we could not vent our tunnel, which meant that uh, when we separated, uh, I hate to use the word explosive, but there was a, a rapid separation because of the pressure in the tunnel when we blew, effectively blew uh, the ring holding the two together. And the LEM separated uh, very rapidly and moved away very quickly. We're gonna modify that slightly uh, on this flight in that rather than pressurize the tunnel with about five pounds per square inch of oxygen, such as we had no choice in, uh, we're gonna vent the tunnel down to about two. Now this two pounds per square inch uh, uh, 
per square inches within the tunnel ought to give us certainly adequate separation from the uh, LEM, command, uh, command module and LEM, and still not give uh, uh, a lot of the debris we had and uh, still not be quite as, uh, as radical or as dynamic as we had. Is it liable to put a wobble in the command module's path trajectory? A wobble? Well, you've got, you've got this force separating them. Is it likely to throw the command module off somehow? Oh, no. It's, it's uh, from the command module, and it's, uh, it's uh, very stable. Now, actually, remember on Apollo 10, when we separated the LEM, we had the command and service module. So there is a slight difference. But we had the reaction control system powered up, and the command and service module, as big and as heavy as it was, really didn't move in attitude at all. Now, I guess we might expect the uh, command module thrusters, attitude thrusters, to fire a little bit to hold it stable. There might be a tendency uh, either in uh, pitch or uh, yaw to move the spacecraft, but I don't think there'll be any problem at all. What were you most worried, and how do you feel now about this flight? Well, I guess uh, concern is a better word, and that concern, of course, was uh, not just those of us in the, in the program, those of us who have who have been there before, but it was a concern of everyone who felt a responsibility uh, for this flight. As a matter of fact, from what I understand, it was a concern of, of not only all of America, but all of the world. And that greatest concern came, of course, in, in, at the initial stages, until we had a real handle uh, on what the problem was, until we could project what our consumables were throughout the mission, until we could project uh, what our uh, our burn requirements in terms of the engine performance and the, the delta V or the velocity we had to add to the spacecraft to bring her home. I think once we, uh, we uh, got those things squared away in our mind, we put the spacecraft on a free return back to the Earth. I think everyone uh, certainly didn't feel complacent. I don't think anyone feels complacent at this moment, although we feel uh, very good that things are working well. I guess uh, myself, I. I was glad to see him turn the corner and come on home. We had a, a very, very minor problem on our flight in that we did lose a fuel cell around the moon after we had done our LEM work. Then we had a second fuel cell that started giving us some uh, oscillating readings. Uh, there were three guys uh, out there, Stafford Young and myself, who, uh, and I think Wally knows what I mean, you, you just you just, uh, your eyes light up when you see that master alarm come on or you see a caution light come on or you have to subdue one of your systems such as a fuel cell like we did. But uh, it's still difficult for me to project uh, the feeling that the Apollo 13 crew must have had because their problems were obviously several, several, several orders of magnitudes greater than any others we've ever had. And uh, God, I just, I'm just proud to be uh, a part of a group uh, that can react like those three guys did, have reacted and are reacting up there. Order. Very well said, Gene. The uh, situation as of the moment, the spacecraft is 27,850 miles from Earth, and its speed now is 8,540 miles an hour, with three hours and five minutes until a scheduled splashdown, uh, two hours and uh, 50 56, let's see, two hours and 54 minutes until uh, the, uh, well, that's not right either, 50, uh, two hours, 51 minutes until they enter the Earth's atmosphere. It's 14 minutes since the, from the time they enter the atmosphere and they hit that radio blackout and they get up to uh, uh, 5,000 degrees of heat on the heat shield and they come plunging on back down to the Pacific Ocean where they're scheduled to land some 600 miles southeast of Pango Pango. The last uh, uh, communication between the uh, spaceship and the ground communicators, it's Capcom uh, Joseph uh, Kerwin uh, down on the ground, uh, uh, was a communication concerning uh, the attempt to sight stars uh, from the command uh, module. Uh, where Jack Swigert is working and trying to use that telescope in the command module to get an alignment that will help them line up the command module for the re-entry. Let's listen as John McLeish, the voice of Apollo, explains the star sighting problem and we hear Jack Swigert's voice coming in occasionally. It's uh, Jack Swigert uh, having 
some difficulty seeing uh, stars uh, through the command module optics. Uh, we don't. These are sightings are used as uh, as a reference in platform alignment. Uh, that's a computer platform. The problem uh, is caused by uh, sunlight uh, reflecting off the uh, surface of the lunar module and uh, this reflection getting into the optics and washing out uh, the view of the stars. If a command module pilot uh, Schweigert is unsuccessful in uh, his star sighting efforts, uh, Jim Lovell uh, will maneuver with the lunar module to uh, give him the opportunity to sight off the uh, sun and moon. We're at uh, 139 hours, uh, 42 minutes, continuing to monitor. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. I was taped about nine minutes ago, actually, and was the voice of the uh, voice of Apollo Mission Control uh, reporting up. We didn't hear Jack Schweigert as I thought we were on there. Ike Pappas is standing by out in Denver, Colorado, at the home of Jack Schweigert's parents, Dr. and Mrs. John Schweigert, Sr. Ike? Walter, Walter, this is uh, 1746 Kearney Street in East Denver. The Schweigerts, Dr. and Mrs. John Schweigert, built this home here 40 years ago, and they never left it. At the moment, they are within following the final stages of the flight of Apollo 13 by way of television. The Schweigerts were up quite early on this cold and drizzly morning. They went to mass to pray for the safe return of the spacecraft and of their son. At the moment, uh, with them is their daughter, Mrs. Phillips Spinelli, her husband, and their three children. They are the first of what is expected to be a long line of relatives that will be here through the morning to follow the splashdown and to be with the Schweigerts. With them also is Tom Andrews of NASA, who's been at this home uh, throughout the flight, uh, handling phone calls, handling the press, and, and generally keeping the Schweigerts advised of the progress of the flight. I asked him what the mood of the family was this morning, and he said they are confident, they are optimistic, they were very happy this morning when they heard on the radio uh, after mass uh, about the successful separation of the service module. But of course they are anxious about the splashdown, as we all are, and I'm sure they are uh, quite a bit more anxious because they are the parents of uh, one of the men up there who's trying to come back. This is Ike Pappas in Denver, and now back to you, Walter, at the CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Down at Houston, uh, since dawn practically, uh, the parade of uh, friends and relatives and other astronauts and wives of astronauts has begun uh, to the homes of uh, Fred Hayes and uh, Jim Lovell, and Marilyn Lovell, uh, managed to get out yesterday afternoon uh, to the beauty parlor, as a matter of fact, to be prepared for this big day. Mary Hayes, who's expecting uh, their uh, fifth child, I guess it is, uh, in her fourth child in, uh, in June, uh, rusted quite a bit uh, yesterday, and uh, they, they did say that she was pretty uh, tired and fatigued. Of course, both of the wives and their children have been keeping up with all aspects of the flight, and it can't have been easy for them. Let's listen in now to Mission Control as they talk to uh, Apollo 13. We're uh, recharged from the limb. Presently, there are uh, 118 amp hours uh, showing uh, for the three uh, entry batteries on the command module. Uh, this is within two uh, amp hours uh, of the uh, liftoff number. We're at 139 hours, uh, 55 minutes into the flight, and this is Apollo Control, Houston. We can listen to communications between the uh, Mission Control and the spacecraft. That was the voice of Mission Control, the public affairs officer who talks to us, John McLeish. The capsule communicator is uh, Joe Kerwin, and uh, perhaps as we tune back there, we can hear the actual communication with the spacecraft. They're, what they're doing now is uh, they're, they're still maneuvering for that moon view uh, to align the platforms, and we'll hear something about that, presumably. Uh, they're preparing now to cut off the lunar module power to the command module, a very important moment. They don't want to do that any earlier than it is scheduled. It's scheduled for 10.23 or 14 minutes from now. Uh, at that time, they begin to power up the command module computers 
And they'll get the first uh, indication then that the computers are working, which they anticipate them to be. One of the problems with the deep cold that the command module has been in now for the last uh, 48 hours is uh, what effect it may have on those computers and their delicate navigation and guidance equipment. Uh, it's expected that it will have none. Most of the delicate components have been tested to minus 20 degrees as, these, uh, as they are built. And all of these have gone through that test, so they don't expect any problems, but it could uh, if they, uh, it could cause some slight anomaly uh, and perhaps put them as much as 25 miles further down range, according to uh, Chris Kraft's uh, report to us uh, oh, yesterday or so. Uh, now, after they get this uh, power cut down from the lunar module to the command module, in fact, uh, they have finished their work with the lunar module, and good old Aquarius will have served them to the last. Uh, then they power up the uh, command module computer. Uh, when they get the command module computer powered up, know that it's working, that they can really uh, depend on the command module for the rest of the flight in. They then transfer uh, the uh, lunar module pilot, that is, moves up to the command uh, module, and uh, they begin uh, to the process of shutting down the lunar module completely. Uh, that we will hear part of. Uh, let's tune in now and see if we can pick up some of the conversation. not hearing much, but I can think of one thing, Walter. The occasion when the crew must get in the command module is the time when they will sever electrical connections with the lunar module. Anyway, the wiring that has been passed through the tunnel hatch will have to be terminated, and uh, that'll be the end of its uh, conversation electronically, at least. There is a, a, a plug, of course, that provides some, but they've jury rig some of this too as you realize yeah they've got a uh, they've got a hose as a matter of fact running mm -hmm. through there which they uh, use to pipe up the oxygen from the uh, lunar module into the command module they got, they got to break all of those circuits and mm -hmm. clean the tunnel up uh, and uh, get the hatch ready to be uh, reasserted reinserted we uh, uh, I've got a little gremlin that sits here on my shoulder anyway just as soon as I say let's go listen to them while they shut up uh, <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> that's what's happening now. We are tuned in. Nothing is being said between uh, uh, Houston and uh, the command module at the moment. Uh, they're still taking the star sights as far as we know. In a moment, they will prepare to cut off that lunar module power, and we'll go back there at that time. We'll be back with more on the flight of Apollo 13 after station identification. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 13 continues after station identification. This is CBS. CBS News color coverage of Odyssey Returns, the flight of Apollo 13 continues. Western Electric and International Paper, the sponsors of the flight of Apollo 13, have requested that their commercial messages not interrupt this portion of the coverage. Here again is Walter Cronkite. The flight of Apollo 13, after all of its trials and tribulations, is going well in these closing hours in space. At two hours and 54 minutes now until scheduled splashdown 600 miles southeast of Samoa in the uh, Pacific Ocean where the helicopter carrier ship 
the Iwo Jima, and other rescue vessels are standing by. Everything has gone well this morning after a cold and sleepless and apparently miserable night as they got ready for the reentry procedures today. Uh, the astronauts are clearly feeling a great deal better. The spaceship has warmed up considerably, and uh, they sound a great deal more cheerful in their conversations with the ground. The first uh, major event this morning went well when Jack Swigert climbed into the command module, and after its uh, three days of being shut down since that explosion on Monday night, uh, it, uh, the batteries came on the line and it began powering up, as they say. Then uh, shortly thereafter, they separated from the dead service module and they had quite a surprise. They got a good look at it as it uh, floated on uh, out beyond them and they found that the entire side of the service module had been blown away by that explosion, a cause still unknown and perhaps it may never be, but they going to try to find out before they fly another one of these missions. It may have been uh, a uh, explosion in an oxygen, a liquid oxygen tank. At any rate, it carried away the whole side of the spacecraft, and uh, the men in Apollo 13 were clearly awed by what they saw. Now they're getting ready to climb up into the, uh, to the uh, command module, and a little later on this morning, uh, jettison old Aquarius, the lunar module which stood them in such good stead as a lifeboat in bringing them back uh, from uh, the moon. Perhaps we can listen in to some of the conversation, if there is some at the moment, up there at, uh, uh, from the command module back to Earth. I hear uh, static only at this moment. There, there has been a limited amount of communication. David Shumesh was pointing out a moment ago that uh, Jim Lovell uh, uh, got uh, a little bit uh, upset about communications last night uh, in asking for a chance to get some rest. I think also, uh, David, what he was talking about too was the fact that it took them so long to get started in reading the uh, new flight plan for reentry up to them. Uh, it, they did start quite late. They got uh, uh, swaggered up. Uh, he was uh, sleeping. He had to take part of the uh, uh, pad down, and then it took them two hours to uh, read it uh, read it up to them. It was a long, long list. Uh, that flight plan is a great book, and a good part of it is in reentry, and they had to get all of that rewritten, and that's what they've been working and testing on. And down in Houston, in these computers and simulators, they were they were working against the clock to get that ready as fast as they could and get it up to the command module. Well, they finally did, but it was quite late last night. They didn't finish till almost 11 o'clock Eastern time. And when you figure they've got to read all that material and uh, rehearse it and study it and talk it over among themselves, it didn't give them a lot of time. And perhaps it's just as well that they were too cold to sleep because they had a lot of work to do. Let's listen by audio tape now to the uh, astronauts' uh, conversation with the ground over the last three minutes. Aquarius, Houston, over. Go ahead, uh, Houston Aquarius, here. Okay, Jim, we're getting about uh, nine minutes from the uh, commencement of uh, command module power-up. And uh, we wanted to uh, just mention to you for Jack's benefit that uh, although the batteries are looking real good, uh, in case they're cool and uh, have a little difficulty hacking the load just at first, we'd like them to monitor main bus voltage uh, to 24 volts or above during the power-up procedure, and if it falls below, we'll have a couple circuit breakers for them that, uh, that will solve the problem. Okay, and I think it's your also monitor a main bus voltage. Uh, negative, not in the command module at this time, because we don't call up uh, telemetry until uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so that's what right. I forgot. Okay, I will call. Thank you. They're sounding a lot uh, more refreshed, it seems to me, Wally, than they have been over the last 24 hours at any rate. Obviously, as they get a little closer to Earth, they're 25,000 miles away now and uh, hurrying home. They've only got three more hours to go, a little less while right they're getting a lot more comfortable. Well, I think it's only appropriate to uh, make note, as I did after Apollo 7, that we do sound a little testy, but that's because we're test pilots. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're feeling better, too, I can see, and we're all the worse for it. <laughs> oh. Punster from outer space, Wally Sharon. I said earlier today that they're, they're cold, tired, 
disgusted, I think was the word I used, uh, certainly frustrated uh, over the fact that they had trained for two years to make a walk on the moon, and instead they have spent these days just fighting out survival and getting back to Earth, and they didn't get that walk on the moon. Uh, Lovell, oh, early Tuesday, I guess it was, while they were still really stabilizing and, and, and being sure that they were going to get back, uh, said uh, it's going a lot better than we ever expected. But then, uh, uh, since then, there have been some words to indicate that they certainly were concerned uh, themselves. Uh, Fred Hayes, at one point, they said, uh, how'd you like to stay aboard that carrier a week? And he said, I don't care just as long as I get to that carrier. Sure. Is the point to... Well, you know, uh, eliminating a bit of jest, really, the, the point is that we, we do train for years for these missions, and when you finally get off the ground, when the, the bolts blow and the liftoff arms release this booster, you say, by golly, this is my flight. And this is probably my answer when I'm asked, well, what, what do you feel on these flights? Well, it's that anticipation. And of course, there's a tremendous letdown when the mission uh, drops out. At first, on this particular case, uh, everything seemed to go well. They had a little trouble, if you recall, with the second stage on the way into Earth orbit. And then everything seemed to look great. Then, of course, this calamity started. Well, at that point, survival is the key. And then, now the, the, the time is adding up. Things are falling into place quite well. And uh, there's no anticipation other than coming home. And of course, they're looking forward to that. But the disappointment will start growing. And uh, yeah. Jim will look back on this as he reminisced, if you recall, with that conversation with Deke Slayton. Looking back at the moon, still looking for Fra Morrow. And he announced before this flight, and I'm sure it's true, that he won't fly again. Uh, with this, uh, he never will see from Morrow, other than from pictures, possibly from Apollo 14. I hope yeah. that we do do it that way. Yeah. And he's had, uh, this is his fourth flight. He's the second man to go to the moon. After all, he was on Apollo uh, 8, but, uh, but now he won't make the landing, as you say. And he had looked forward to two very interesting longest walks yet on the moon, a long traverse of... Uh, 2,500, 3,500 feet or something like that, or half a mile anyway, uh, in which they would uh, they would have climbed a cone crater, which is a pretty good size hill, and uh, it would have been a fascinating, fascinating walk for him. But as um, is typical now, here we are. I'm sure we, we're feeling much more relieved, and now we'll start talking about the disappointments of the flight rather than the success which is bringing the crew back. Uh, Neil Armstrong said uh, yesterday about disappointments that... Uh, that uh, you know, that's the way he felt when he came back from Gemini 8, in which they tumbled and had uh, up to now, I suppose, our worst crisis in uh, space. Uh, the getting down was the big uh, problem at the time, and not much thought about the scrub mission and all that. But uh, as soon as he got out of the, the capsule, uh, he, was, he was anxious to get back to the Cape and get in another one and go. Well, this is part of our reading in this business, Walter, we're perfectionists and we want everything to go right. And I, uh, I know on my last flight, I wanted it to be better than the previous flight. And of course, each one of us looks at that, that way and uh, you're seeing human emotions being stripped raw. That's really what it is. And uh, when, uh, when we start complaining, it's, it's that way. I don't think you'll find any of us complaining about not having had a flight <laughs> until they realize that they can't have another flight. We, uh uh, should be hearing from them any minute now as they prepare to cut off that lunar module power to the command module. It was scheduled for just about this minute. Uh, we're tuned in. Nothing is, uh, there had been any transmission for the last, uh, oh, five minutes, I guess. I haven't heard a word from Apollo, and I've got it feeding in right here. When we do, we'll, uh, let you know. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I sent out for a couple of balloons. <laughs> Well, and, you use uh, your separation uh, technique here. Yeah, because okay, it's, it's Friday, and every day, I, Friday, I blow up balloons. I, here we, here we're, let's listen to Houston now here. Okay, uh, you're go to start uh, powering up the command module. Right now, we're right now. Okay.
Okay, we have the Olympic record. I suspect this is going to be the, the interesting part of this whole session since we heard of the calamity Monday night is how well we get through this particular phase yeah, of the, the mission. So through the, the power up, you mean, how, right. how well the command line is going to function. Right. Now, my pulse rate, I'm sure, will decrease rapidly as the power comes on the line. <laughs> We'll stay tuned here and listen for the first word from them that the, how it, how the power is working. Of course, the uh, tests have been run so far. It sounds very favorable. The uh, buses have been checked. The voltage is great. Uh, we have the last reckoning I recall here was 118 ampere hours. Okay, Houston, you're looking at it. So there's telemetry. Okay, Roger, say. stand by. Okay, press on, Fred. Okay. I think we have a, a lot of laundry men here, the way we use press on so often. Have you heard that phrase <laughs> quite often today? <laughs> that just means there's a lot of starch in these guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> boy. Bill Anders was pressing on with new axles for those covered wagons, I recall that very well. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, the point I'd like to make, though, with that reminiscing is that you have okay, to fly... Okay, that's, uh, that's it, Joe. Yeah. Okay, real good. Great. Great power up, huh? Well, now we'll see how the heaters work and how that IMU comes on the line, and I can just sit back and relax and watch them come home. We'll be uh, keeping tuned in here to hear the next word from them on uh, how the computer comes on the line. But out in Denver, Ike Pappas is with Jack Swigert's parents at this critical moment. Dr. and Mrs. John Swigert Sr. Ike? Walter, the Swigerts have been kind enough to uh, step outside, uh, interrupting briefly uh, the, their uh, following of the uh, flight. Uh, this also is uh, young Phil Spinelli, who is the uh, grandson. Uh, let me ask you first, uh, Dr. Schweigert, uh, we know how, uh, pretty much how it's been going uh, for the astronauts and for your son uh, this week. Uh, can you tell me how it's been going for you? Well, I've been gradually becoming more and more eased, mentally anyway. And uh, this morning at uh, Mass, why, I, I thought it was my today after hearing the final separation there. Do you feel that now, uh, Mrs. Schweigert, that uh, all will go well? Oh, I do. I have utmost confidence in everything now. Tell me uh, what your feelings were earlier in the week when, uh, when you got the bad news. <laughs> well, they were very low and uh, extreme worry and uh, almost hopelessness I, for me. And uh, now I'm, I'm much better. <laughs> Dr. Schweigert, uh, have you uh, heard from a lot of people, uh, from, from relatives and so on, uh, about this? Well, I think we've heard from practically every state in the Union. Friends that I haven't heard from for years have uh, sent me notes offering their prayers and their hopes and best wishes. And to me, that's the finest thing that I, I think I could experience. Let's ask uh, young Phil Spinelli. Uh, Phil, uh, in, your, in your classes and so on, uh, had the boys and girls been talking to you about the flight and so on? Have you... Yes, but I really haven't had much time to talk to them. Why not? I've been out of school. Oh, I see. Uh, what about um, your following of the flight? What about uh, your uncle up there? I've been following him. I've been watching TV every time I could. How do you feel about uh, his predicament and the predicament to the astronauts and so on? I feel that it's great. You feel it's great? You think everything's going to go well? Yeah. I guess I have to ask you the inevitable question. Do you want to be an astronaut? I really don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, fine. Uh, let me ask you now, Dr. Schweikert. Uh, do you feel uh, any disappointment at all uh, that, that the men and your son did not get to the moon? In a way, yes. Uh, but that's so overshadowed by my relief in that for these people throughout the whole world, the wonderful technicians and uh, the Lord himself is but them back safely. I think that overshadows everything. What do you think is uh, the one thing that has gotten <clears throat> you as parents uh, to this point, through this very critical time in your life? 
Well, I think it's the combination of the the wonderful minds that are working in Houston to solve all their problems, and it's the uh, it's the working with the astronauts up there, improvising to make things work up there. Dr. Schweiger, what do you think uh, is the one thing that's helped you most in, at this time? Well, it's the, the unification, I think, of the whole world. I think this is the one thing that I'm, has impressed me. And uh, I think the, uh, that picture in the paper there, the praying hands with a capsule in there, I think is the greatest uh, thing. It struck me as being the most significant thing of the whole thing. The whole world is really uh, with us here. And uh, how can you fail that way? You said also that your faith uh has not wavered at all. Not a bit. Not a bit. I was oh, tried now and then, but uh, it always came back, and I knew they were going to be all right. What would you say is the basis of that faith, sir? I don't know. I suppose it's uh, it comes from my family. It was instilled uh, in them and uh, through them into me. Mr. Schweiger, uh, finally, what what are some of the thoughts of your son that you have at this point? Well, I'm pleased that he was able to go and that they are soon going to be back. Dr. Schweiger? What, uh, I didn't hear the... Well, the question is, uh, at, at this point, as uh, your son is about to return to Earth after a very trying, harrowing experience and so on, uh, the other astronauts are back. Uh, what are your thoughts of your son at this point? <laughs> I'm just glad that he's here. Uh, I, yes, Walter. I, think I, uh, I'm just sort of curious. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Dr. and Mrs. Swigert for being with us this morning like this, and young Mr. Spinelli there. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm wondering, all of us parents uh, face little decisions along the road uh, with our children that uh, seem to be crucial as the years go on. They develop that way. Uh, back when uh, when Jack was in the eighth grade, uh, he begged to take flying lessons, and uh, the Swigerts uh, yielded, uh, saying if he made some of his own money, as I remember it, uh, he could do it. Uh, and he regrets that he took to this uh, life, which has led him to be an astronaut and, and have to scramble uh, to safety from way out there 200,000 miles from Earth. What are... Uh we're having uh, some technical problems here. Could you please repeat the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll try to make it shorter this time, as a matter of fact. One of the technical problems we had was uh, one of those uh, airplanes that Jack Schweiger uh, likes to fly flew over our house, <laughs> and uh, we didn't quite hear. We were drowned out somewhat. Would you please go again. Well, I was ask, asking if in these last few days, if they had any regrets that uh, back when he was in the eighth grade, they yielded to his uh, pleadings to take flying lessons. Dr. Schweiger, do you have I have no regrets, regrets whatsoever. Mrs. Schweiger, do no. you? No. Uh, Dr. Schweiger was in England at the time, and he just said, get him a good instructor and make him earn half his money, so that we didn't have any regrets. Do you have any regrets at all that he uh, entered the astronaut program no. or that, that he wound up in a predicament uh, no. up there? No. Well, Dr. Mrs. Schweiger, as well as Chiro, I'd like to say that uh, Jack's done something that very few men have. He has flown around the moon, and this is still a fairly unique trip to all of us. Well, that's awfully nice. It's a trip I'd like to have. <laughs> would you? I would, too. <laughs> so would I. I don't think I would. <laughs> I'll stay all. How about, let's ask uh, Phil, do you want to fly around the moon someday? Yeah. If you become an astronaut, which you've not decided to do. <laughs> okay. Well, I believe that's about it. Thank you very much uh, for coming out, and uh, I suppose the rest of the morning uh, you'll be right by the television set. Uh, yes, we will. And following the rest of the flight. And uh, good luck to you, and uh, we, we all uh, share your confidence and your optimism. I'll have to treat my own eyes, you know, TV eyes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, come on, Dr. Swiger. <laughs> Watching KLZ in Denver never hurt anybody's eyes, I'm sure. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very, very much, Dr. and Mrs. Swiger. Thank you very much for being right. with us this morning. We can listen now to audio tape of the last uh, few minutes uh, in the communications between the spacecraft and mission control. Let's listen in. 
Apollo Control, Houston, uh, 140 hours, 16 minutes uh, down to the flight. Uh, network. Uh... Go ahead. Roger, we uh, have Command Module AOS request Omni Charlie in the CM. Over. Omni Charlie, okay. Bye. That call up from Joe Kerwin uh, confirming that uh, Honeysuckle uh, has acquisition of signal on the Command Module S band. We're at 140 hours, 16 minutes, Apollo 13, uh, 21,000. 92 nautical miles away. <laughs> the one MC. I've got Fred up there with uh, Jack now, helping to power up the CM, and I'm uh, staying down in good old Aquarius. Understand, Jim. It appears to be a little chilly uh, inside the command module cabin at the present time. Uh, we have a reading of 38 degrees. First 74. Stand by for just one minute, Jim. I know it. Okay, Aquarius Houston recommend in Odyssey that he uh, switch the power amplifier to low. Over. Power amplifier to low. It's been switched to low, Houston. Roger. Okay, uh, verify the power amp talkback is gray, Jim. Okay. That's verified? Okay. We're at 140 hours, 23 minutes now to the flight. Uh, we presently show Apollo 13 at uh, 20,257 nautical miles away and having a velocity of 13,622 feet per second. This is Apollo Control, Houston. That translates to 23,750 miles approximately out from Earth and a velocity of 9,140 uh, miles an hour. Uh, so Fred Hayes is now in his uh, right-hand uh, seat as the uh, lunar module pilot uh, in the command module, and Jack Swigert uh, presumably is in his center seat uh, and uh, where he rides as the command module pilot, leaving the left seat uh, for Jim Lovell, who will be climbing up out of the lunar module uh, in another, uh, oh, about uh, half hour from now. I think I uh, uh, understand that the way we'll run this one now, Jack will do the controlling for the re-entry. So Jim will probably be in the center seat. Uh, uh -huh. as, uh, this, this is the technique that worked out to... Uh, relieve the training load for the lunar module crew, particularly with all the extravehicular walking they do on the moon, uh, the command module pilot will then basically fly it back home. Well, now, is that the way they take off also? No, okay. no, Jim took off in the left seat. So the couches are no longer custom fitted uh, as they were in the older days. There was a line uh, in one of the uh one advisories from Houston last night that they would re-enter as they left. Well, uh, they now, may, but that, maybe, but yeah. maybe it didn't mean to be yeah. technical. Uh, maybe it just meant they were going to re-enter in the <laughs> command module, which uh, I think they will do. Indeed, uh, <laughs> uh, they have to. The uh, it's kind of surprising that the uh, 
Uh, temperature is still so low, 38 degrees up there, because we've been told that they were, Jack Swagger was reasonably comfortable in the command line, but 38 is mighty cold. It's a lot colder than it was last night when, it was the, when the temperature was reported down in the low 40s. Uh, but uh, it should start warming up now. Uh, as well as they use the power, because you uh, recall they're really in a thermos bottle, and this is, uh, electrical power is utilized, the byproduct is heat, the temperature should come up. You know, it's amazing. I think back of how we, in our early checklists, way back in Mercury and then Gemini, and even on the early Apollo flights, would pre-cool the cabin to avoid the heat of re-entry. And I can recall some of those sweat boxes I was in for stress tests for heat of re-entry. You know, here, uh, they're down to 38 degrees, which is, I would say, gonna, very well pre-cooled. They're going to drop an ice cube through the atmosphere. <laughs> it may, may start all sorts of chain reactions in the weather probably shouldn't even suggest that because people do think that you know <laughs> you, you get it's amazing the number of uh, letters that uh, we get and uh, nasa gets that uh, people suggest that uh, the the weather is changing because we're sending all those rockets up there and piercing the clouds and fouling That's up amazing. the weather picture it's not fouling up nearly as much as the exhaust from all of our automobiles and uh, other air pollution is fouling up the weather by creating a canopy of carbon dioxide over it well, interestingly enough, uh, this first stage, for example, it went up to some 20-odd miles with uh, its propellant was using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which are not pollutants. They're, they're nice guys. They make water and, and uh, oxygen that you breathe. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to see, uh, if we could afford to run automobiles, then that'd be fine, but that's a rather exotic fuel. Down in Houston at the Manned Space Center, Bruce Morton is with Alan Bean, who walked on the moon, you all recall, during Apollo 12 last November and flight director Clifford Charlesworth. Bruce? Gentlemen, you were uh, together in a sense on 12, uh, Cliff as a flight director and uh, Al as an astronaut. Uh, the next problem here seems to be getting aligned properly for re-entry. Uh, why, why is that difficult here uh, compared to what you had to go through last time? Well, the difference here is uh, the fact that we've got the lunar module on the front end. Uh, I think Jack might have a little trouble looking uh, out through his optics and not being interfered with by reflections off the uh, limb. Now, it's, uh, we've been talking about this around the office, and we sort of felt that he'd be able to do it anyway. And I think they're just in the process now of starting to crank up the guidance and the optics, and we'll know pretty soon where he's going to be able to do it. Even if he can't, uh, they can go to an attitude that will allow him to sight off the moon and the sun and get a very good alignment that way too. Not quite as good as a star, but uh, acceptable for re-entry. Cliff, this, uh, this one must have been a flight director's nightmare, uh, just a drastically more ad-libbing than anybody ever had to do before. Well, uh, I think that's, that's probably true, Bruce. Uh, of course, you know, they develop all sorts of what-if cases and procedures to do these sort of things, and you try to work on the ones that, that you uh, have to do in a hurry, which they accomplish very quickly. Then they have to spend uh, hours and hours going back and uh, iterating on new procedures and developing new procedures. And uh, all of the people on the ground, uh, controllers in conjunction with the pilots, of course, have been working on this since the incident occurred. You now, what seemed to you the most serious problem going back to Monday night when all these worries were, uh, were on us? Well, I, I guess the most serious uh, thought I had, I was afraid uh, that they might lose all the fuel cells before they got over in the limb and got it cranked up. Uh, the fuel cell two went almost immediately, and then fuel cell three after that. And I don't think uh, we really know when fuel cell one was going to go. And fortunately, uh, the pressure stayed up on it and it ran down to something like 80 or 90 PSI in the oxygen, which allowed uh, Jim and Fred, who were worried about that too, to get over there and get the lamp cranked up. I think the thing that was the best part of the mission so far, and uh, looks like it's going to be the uh, remainder, is the fact that they, all three of them, were so cool in a circumstance that uh, was as critical as we've ever seen. The same thing was true over at Mission Control. I was over there at the time, and uh, everyone there knew his job and uh, performed real uh, calm and collected. It, it, that's been one of the beauties of the mission, really. 
What were your own thoughts? Uh, did the, uh, had you, before 12, uh, worried about this kind of thing happening? Well, we had talked about it a lot. I don't think uh, Pete Dick or I really uh, imagined uh, that we could lose all three fuel cells as fast as they lost them. I guess we've been looking at uh, schematic diagrams that have one fuel cell on the right-hand side of the page and one fuel cell on the left-hand side of the page. And so you tend to think of them Apparently, we uh, lost our audio line with Houston as uh, we're talking to Alan Bean there, the astronaut who walked on the moon with Pete Conrad in Apollo 12, and with uh, uh, Clifford Charlesworth, the, uh, one of the flight directors. I thought the point that Alan Bean was making, uh, I immediately realized what he was trying to get at, is a very good one. Uh, you tend, through training, to uh, associate with the drawings. He was saying schematics. Uh, and felt, and he was trying to make the point, that the fuel cells were isolated from each other, like one side of the page and another one. In fact, they're in the same bay. And sympathetically, they were all destroyed with this oxygen tank explosion, or at least...